the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Father God, we come before you today, Lord, and we're just grateful for the opportunity that we have tonight to be in the house of the Lord. Lord, I'm so grateful that we get to come into the house, Lord, and to just draw our eyes to you, Father. I just thank you, Lord, that we don't come into this place to hear from a man or to hear from a woman. Lord, we don't come into this place to be entertained, but God, we come into this place to hear from you. And we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. And Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus tonight that the Holy Spirit would minister to us through me, through the word that you've had for us tonight. Lord, I thank you that you would help us to open our eyes, to see in our ears, to hear the word. Lord, that it would be a seed sown into good ground and that it would bear much fruit in our lives. Lord, that we could take the word that you have for us tonight, walk out of these four walls of this building, and be impactful in the kingdom of God, wherever it is that we have, that you have for us, with our families, with our friends, wherever it might be, Lord. And I thank you for that. Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, we don't see ourselves as better than anybody else, but as co-laborers in the body of Christ. So Lord, I thank you that you set your hand upon all the churches across the Inland Empire and all around the world that are sharing and preaching and teaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ today. Lord, we ask that your presence would be amongst them as well. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honor for all that you're going to accomplish in your body, the church. And we give you the honor in Jesus' name. We all said, Amen. Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm excited for the word of the Lord tonight. Fun topical message. Something that I think that is uh, relative to the time. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians in the ninth chapter. 1 Corinthians in the ninth chapter. And as you turn there, let me ask you a question. Does anybody in here an Olympics fan? A few of you. Let me just tell you that I don't give a hoot about swimming for four years of my life, but then all of a sudden there's eight days when every, every round about every four years, when all of a sudden it's like all I can do is just like pay attention to whatever's going on in the swimming matches, like the diving and the water polo, wow, and archery and shooting and sailing and rowing. I watched rowing today and I was just like, oh my gosh. And you know what the funny thing is, is that I'm, I have to admit that I'm an Olympics-aholic. Olympaholic, I guess you could say, that whenever there's an Olympics on, my wife and I, we just, we hunker down, you know, we get the, the bowl of popcorn because it makes us feel better when we eat popcorn watching all these tried and true fit people out there doing their things. The, the more junk I eat, the better I feel as I watch them knowing that, you know, that, that, that's our nation's pride. But, you know, there's something about the Olympics. There's something about the, the Olympic Games every four years for the summer, every four years for the winter, offset by two years. You know that there's just something about the national pride as, as you see the nation send their best, their, 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 those who have worked hard, those who have pushed, those who have competed throughout their lives, throughout the colleges, throughout the professional sports. You know, we got the dream team. We got Kobe and LeBron who beat, uh, who did they beat today? They beat France by, I think, 30 points or something like that. I mean, we are the USA, and it doesn't matter if you like, see this, look at this. It doesn't matter if you like basketball or not. You're like, man, USA all the way. <laughs> see, there's something about the Olympics. There's something about that. Well, you know what's fun is that the Word of God equates so much of athleticism, of, of, of athletic competition into our spiritual walk with God. And I thought, man, you know, everybody was, everybody's talking about the opening ceremony. Everybody's talking about Queen Elizabeth jumping out the helicopter with James Bond, you know, and, and, and the, the opening ceremony in the Olympics. And you're saying, Pastor, like, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, I just blew it for you. The queen jumped out of a helicopter for the uh, opening ceremony. Anyways, you know, and it's just exciting to, 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 to see the different competition and the national spirit. You know, you could, you could be like me, somebody who doesn't care about different sports. There are sports that I didn't even know existed until the Olympics, but now that the Olympics are on, I'll tell you what, badminton is one of the coolest things to watch. And I don't know, there have been times in my life where I have been around a ping pong table and I have thought, I, I've given myself, I've given an opponent a pretty good match here and again, but then when I watch, uh, they don't call it ping pong, they call it table tennis. When I watch table tennis, I think, how do they even see the ball, let alone hit it? And I'll tell you what, there's just something fun about the Olympics. There's just something great about watching your nation and watching the people as they parade and wear the colors of their uniforms. And there's just there's a sense of pride. 
But there's also a sense of relation when we can see the, the athletics. You know, we were just watching last night the, the gymnastics and the, and the gymnasts, and we were talking about them. I mean, it's amazing the muscles that you see on these athletes, especially the gymnasts, I mean, because the weightlifters, you see them, and they've got concentrated focus areas, so they're, they're, they're bulky on the chest, or on the, on, but the gymnasts, they're just refined in every, I mean, there's just, it, it, it's crazy, it just, it, it blows my mind that somebody's body could be like that, it looks like David, you know, the, the, the statue carved out of, out of marble, and, and it's just amazing to see, but the work that goes into that. And to see that the highlight, you know, these are the people that have worked hard to get to where they're at. Now they're representing the six people or the, the, the five people or whatever it is on the certain team that represent the, our nation. And, and the nations around the world come together to compete in the spirit of sport. And I'll tell you what, it's just, it's great to compare that. And Paul the Apostle wasn't naive in understanding that when he talked to the people, especially the church in, in Corinth where we're, we're reading to, you know, this is, this is in Greece and in the areas around and surrounding. And, you know, these people were no strangers to games. They were no strangers to competition. And, and you know, Paul the Apostle, I was reading earlier today in, in my studies, he says he becomes all things to all men so that he could reach and, and speak to them. And one of the things he did is he related to them through athletics. And I think it interesting that, you know, I found it fun to, tonight to compare. So the title of tonight's message is Pressing On because we're going to talk about what it means to press on. Pressing on meaning to push on for something, for that goal. Paul the Apostle talking about that. So if you've got your Bibles, we're in, in 1 Corinthians in the ninth chapter. 1 Corinthians in the ninth chapter. In verse number 24 is where we'll pick up. Paul the Apostle is writing and he says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? Obvious statement. Those who run in a race, everybody who is in a race competes or participates within that race, but only one receives the prize. We think of a marathon or something with a large number of participants. Speaking of the Olympic Games, as we were talking about, I was watching the men's cycling road race, and there was some 50 different competitors all in one large group of cyclists as they were going through the course. They all are participating in the race, but yet only one person receives the gold medal. But one receives a prize. Run in such a way, Paul the Apostle says, and now he turns it to the church. He says, run in such a way that you may obtain it. Is he talking about, well, is he saying, well, you and I need to get in it. Then we need to get into training. We need to start, you know, working off some of the flab that we've got, you know, growing around the back and some of those areas down on the, and we got to get in there and we got to start running. The race. No, no, no. He's not talking about you and I getting into the Coliseum. He's not talking about you and I getting a plane ticket saying, how do I get myself into the Olympic competition? Paul the Apostle is speaking about spiritual things, but using the physical example of an athlete. And he goes on to say, run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do, this is verse 25, now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. But we for an imperishable crown. So see, here's the difference. As Paul the Apostle says that everybody who runs in a race runs to a, to, to, for, for the prize. And he says, so you need to run in such a way that you get that gold medal, that you get that prize, that you stand on that podium, but he's not speaking to the physical race. He's not saying that whatever your hobby is, that you need to get in there. If you're playing soccer, he says, you don't need to, he's not telling you to push so hard that you're getting up there with, with, uh, you know, with David Beckham and you're playing with the soccer team. No, 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 no. Because he goes on to say, he says, everybody who competes, competes for a, a, a prize, a crown that fades away, a gold medal. But you and I compete for a crown, a prize that does not fade away. Eternal life with our God, with our Father in heaven, with Jesus Christ seated at the throne of God today. So you and I compete in a race where the prize is not a gold, a silver, or a bronze medal. Where the prize is not an honorable mention. Our name inscribed on a wall of world records or times. But rather, our prize is to compete, to finish the race that God has set before us. So he says, for we have an imperishable crown. Verse number 26, therefore I run thus, therefore I run this way, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight not as one who beats the air. He says, I don't run the race with uncertainty. I don't fight as a shadow box or somebody who, who fights against error, or fights against their own figure. But he goes on to say, but I discipline my body 
And I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should have become disqualified. Such an interesting statement. And he says, basically, I push myself. I press on. I move forward. I I put my body into uh, into subjection. I put my body into discipline so that when the time comes, I myself would not be found disqualified, would not be found to have, you know, Pastor Jim a few weeks ago on a Wednesday night was talking about the the king of, 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 of Babylon. Belteshazzar and the writing that was on the wall and the thing on the wall that said that you have been weighed and found too light. He says, I put myself into subjection. I put my body into subjection so that when it comes time for me to be weighed, when it comes time for me to be judged, when it comes time for the judges to look upon me, the judge Jesus Christ, God the Father, who sees all, we talked about the account before God, that I would not found, be found to be disqualified. That I would be found to be a winner of my race. That I ran for my crown. And that when it comes time for for you and I to stand before God. That we hear those words. Well done good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest. Why? Because we have run our race in such a way. Like Paul the Apostle said. That we may obtain the prize. The prize of being with our Lord and Savior. The prize of living a life. How God has called us and designed us to be. So there are some things today. Out of the scripture that I wanted to point out to you in relation to looking at an athlete, in relation to looking at the Olympic Games, because everybody's thinking about it, they're talking about it. When you read the news article, you read about how Michael Phelps missed out on, on, on the, the 400 individual melody, medley relay by fourth place, and, and you're reading all these news articles. I'm sorry if I blew it for somebody who was DVRing that. I apologize. I'll try not to blow any more things. But today I want to talk and I want to show you some things based out of the thought of athleticism, based on the thought of those who push themselves. You know, the title of today's message is is to press on, to push against. To to press on means to to, to fight against something. And we'll see Paul the Apostle use that term in just a moment. So I've got four things that if you apply these to your life, they may, now you can apply them to your your physical life. If you're in a diet plan or a workout plan, sure, great, go ahead, do that. But I'm not talking to you about your diet. I'm not talking to you about your physical appearance. I'm not talking to you about your weightlifting or how you wanted to get back to your high school weight. I'm not talking to you about that. But you can apply these to it. Yes, absolutely. What I am talking to you about is your race with God, my walk with God, ours together as the people of God who God has called us to be, who we run our race. I want you to understand that these are some spiritual principles with physical descriptions to them. Can you guys grab a hold of that? You guys understand what we're talking about? So when I talk about sports terms and I give you some sports analogies, I don't want you to think that Pastor Luke is talking to you about sports tonight because I am talking to you about your walk and my walk with God and how it pertains to our lives eternally. Not just today, not just tomorrow, but in the long term as well. How we reflect our lives to God and that we run in such a way that we obtain the prize. Are you with me tonight? So I've got four things based out of the Word of God tonight in my studies that, I've, that God has given me to, to speak to you on the, the subject of pressing on. So I'm going to say the term pressing on, and then I'm going to complete that statement. Number one, pressing on takes drive. It takes drive. What I mean by that is pressing on takes motivation. It takes a drive to get through it. It takes a commitment. You know, one day, you know, you know in, in sports, you know, thinking of the Olympic athletes, thinking of the great athletes, uh, let's say Michael Phelps, I believe he's one medal away from being the all-time or tying the all-time Olympic record of, of the most decorated Olympian. You know, one day, Michael Phelps didn't just wake up and say, I'm going to swim and show up to, uh, where was the first place, Athens, the Olympics in Athens, and say, hey, guys, I wanted to swim. I want to give it a shot. Can I try? Can I, can, I, can I try? Can I jump in the water? You know, you, it takes drive. It takes commitment. Athletes, great athletes, don't just wake up one day and say, okay, here I am, I'm ready to go. It takes a commitment. It takes a drive because it's a grueling process. There are days when they don't want to get up and train. There are days when their body aches. There are days when their muscles are sore. There are days when they've sustained injury. And there are, there are consequences to things that they have done. But they have got to continue to press on, to fight on against those feelings, against those thoughts, to continue on their regiment, to continue on with their, their goal in mind so that they run, like Paul the Apostle said, that they run in such a way that they would obtain it. And so you and I, in our walk with God, in our relationships with God, we have got to understand that when we press on, 
according to the crown that has been given before us, that has been set before us, the prize that is not perishable, not just the gold medal, but eternal life through, with God in heaven, that when we look at the goal, when we look at the prize, we have got to have a drive to complete it. We have got to have a motivation that when we wake up to say, man, I, you know, sometimes we wake up, and I'll tell you, I don't know if, it's, if you're this way, but I'll tell you, there's been times when I wake up and my body says, I don't want to be a Christian today. I don't feel like following God today. I want to have a me day. I don't know, is, is Pastor Luke alone in here or am I standing up here on my little podium by myself or is there anybody else in the house that sometimes your body just says, I don't feel like I want to do this today. Sometimes your situation says, I don't feel like I want to get through this today. I'm ready to call it quits. I'm ready to say, no, nope, no, nah, I gave it a shot, but you know, it's just not for me. But let me tell you something. It takes drive to press on. It takes motivation to press on to say, when you wake up and say, man, I don't know what my situation says, I can't do it. My body says, my flesh says, I don't want to do this today. It takes drive to say, I don't care what my body says. I don't care what my situation says. I'm going to press on towards the mark that God has set for me. We have got to have drive. Looking back to 1 Corinthians in the ninth chapter in the 24th verse, it says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives a prize? So run in such a way that you obtain it. You know, athletes continually push themselves to be greater. Are you with me? You know, an athlete sees a number and a name. It doesn't matter what the sport is. They see a number and a name. They see a score and somebody who's got a record. They see, a, if it's a runner, if you're talking about Hussein Bolt, he sees a, a time, a number, and a name associated with that time. If it's the rowing team, they see a number, how many meters that they went within a time, and they see a name a, 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 attached to that. If it's a swimmer, they see a number, a time, and a name of whoever met that time. World record. And they push themselves with a drive to find that name and that number and to make it that, their name and their number. That's what athletes do. Imagine if they woke up and somebody set a world record. Imagine if somebody swam as fast as anybody swam and they said, okay, that's it. It's unattainable. No more. Oh, well, well that, that's the fastest time. Nobody will ever, ever beat that. Don't even try. Don't even bother. And there was no drive behind beating that name. Imagine if Babe Ruth's, I, I couldn't tell you the exact number, but if Babe Ruth's 730 or 4 or 35, whatever it is, home runs, was it. In the, in, 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 in the National Baseball League, they said, that's it. It's unattainable. Nobody could ever beat it. Nobody could ever match it. Don't even try. Where would the drive be behind that? But an athlete, when they wake up in the morning and they get to the game and they get to the match, they get to the competition, they see a name and a number. And they say, that world record is mine. I'm going to push myself day in and day out to make sure that it's my name written on that wall, that I see my name up on that scoreboard, that I see my number up in the glory for all to see. Because they see in a name and a number. So what do you and I see? What is it that you and I see? Paul the Apostle says that I press forward, that I press on, I run in such a way that I may obtain. So they run in such a way that they might obtain a number and a name. What do we we have something more than a perishable crown, something more than a gold medal. We have Jesus. If you've got your fingers or if you've got your Bibles, keep your finger in 1 Corinthians because we're going to come back to maybe if you've got a ribbon, put that ribbon there in 1 Corinthians and turn with me to the book of Philippians. Here again, Paul the Apostle is speaking about athletics in Philippians in the third chapter. In the 13th and 14th verse, Paul the Apostle says this, he says, Brethren, I don't count myself to, app to have apprehended. I haven't finished. I haven't obtained yet. But one thing I do, forgetting those things are which, those are which behind and reaching forward for those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Paul the Apostle says, listen, I have not yet obtained. There is not, while there is breath still in my lungs, Paul the Apostle says, I am not done. 
And I don't, I, what I do, he says, what I do is I take the things of yesterday and I leave them there and I press forward for today. You know, athletics, Olympics, baseball, football, soccer, whatever the sport might be, whether it's Olympics or not, they leave the record for yesterday. Why? Because that record was set so that somebody else can break it. And you may have had a good year, you may have had a bad year, but Paul the Apostle says, you leave the past behind you and don't stare at the past, but give yourself the drive, the motivation to say, whether I may have had a bad match or I may have had a good match, I'm going to press on towards the next one because I'm going after the prize that God has set before me, the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. So we have got to have the drive, the motivation to say, you know what? It doesn't matter what yesterday's game has. It doesn't matter what we did. Here, listen, let me give you an example of the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. It doesn't matter that we had 14,000 salvations last year. That was last year. And if we live in last year, then we're running. Paul the Apostle says, I don't want to fall, so I'm going to come on the floor. Paul the Apostle says, I run in such a way. If you're running a race... And you're running like this? Are you running in a way that you're going to obtain? You're running in a way where you're going to eat asphalt is what you're running in a way. And you and I as Christians, you and I as children of God, you and I as of, uh, of those who are running in a race for a crown that we don't get uh, that's a gold medal, but something more, ten something more invaluable than that, we have to run in such a way to keep our eyes forward towards the prize, to keep our eyes on the finish line, to keep our eyes on the podium that God has set before us. So we have got to run in such a way. So that takes drive, that takes motivation to push ourselves. Are you guys with me th tonight? Secondly, we're talking about the idea of pressing on in our walk with God. Pressing on, number two, pressing on takes training. Pressing on tra takes training. You know, without drive and motivation, it takes study. It takes knowledge. It takes strategy. You know, a race. Let's, let's, let's broaden our spectrum. Let's, let's use runners and we'll go all the way to the other end of it, and we'll say NASCAR, okay? So you've got NASCAR on one side, not an Olympic sport, maybe someday. And you've got a runner, all right? There, even though one person is using his own ability, his own body, and the other person is using a car, a race is not about how fast somebody can put their pedal to the metal in NASCAR. A race is not about how fast somebody can run out of the starting gate and sustain that. A race has strategy. A race has skill. A race has understanding of the knowledge, uh, uh, has, a, has a knowledge of your competition, a knowledge of your own abilities and limitations. A, a race takes training. You can't just wake up one day and decide, you know what, I'm going to ride, I'm going to run the thousand meter dash today and have never trained, have never positioned or conditioned your body for that because let me tell you something, it's going to be bad for you. I promise the result will not be what you thought it was and your body will tell you something other than what you thought it would tell you. Because a race to compete, to run the race, to get into athletics, whatever it might be, to throw a javelin in track and field, to jump a high jump, whatever it might be, it takes training. It takes knowledge to know, okay, I need to step this way and I need to run this way and I need to have my toes pointed in a certain direction so that I get the maximum efficiency, whatever it might be. Well, how does that apply to our walk with God? Oftentimes what we do is we get into it and we go gung-ho. We jump right in and say, all right, I'm going to run that thousand, that thousand meter dash. And while God has a plan for you and I, he has a plan for you and I to get fed by the word of God. You know, Jesus Christ spent time hearing the, the, the people and the, 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 in, in, in listening. He spent time in the word of God before. You know, Jesus Christ wasn't born. And as a 16-month-old baby was in the temple, miraculously speaking and preaching and teaching the Word of God. 30 years of his life went by before he jumped into it. Because it takes training. Paul the Apostle, in his miraculous conversion, when Ananias laid hands on him and the scales were removed from his eyes and he received uh, sight, Paul the Apostle went to the church in Antioch where he sat underneath teachers, where he sat underneath the church. At first they didn't want him. I teach church history so I can tell you. At first they were afraid of him. 
but he sat underneath something. He sat underneath a man named Barnabas, and him and Barnabas went on a missionary trip. And actually, Barnabas was the leader of that missionary trip, but by the time they returned, Saul and Barnabas were on a mission, or Paul and Barnabas were on a mission trip, not Barnabas and Paul. Because he had to take time to receive the Word of God, to train in the Word of God, to hear and understand the Word of God. You and I have got to get into the Word of God. You and I have got to get into services and listen when we're here to accept it, to take the notes, to apply them, not just on a Sunday morning, not just on a Sunday night, but what happens on Monday, what happens on Tuesday, what happens on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We have got to apply what God has given us this week to our training efforts so that we can be prepared to run the race that God has for us. Looking at 1 Corinthians in the 9th chapter, verse number 25, I told you to keep your fingers there in 1 Corinthians, the 9th chapter, verse number 25, it says, And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. But we, for an imperishable crown, verse number 26, he says, Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. He doesn't say, listen, I don't come into the competition. I don't come into the match. I don't come into the fight, whatever you want to call it. Because it doesn't just about running. Think about a fight. Boxers, they have got to know their competition. They have got to know that, that their competition has a mean left hook. Because if they don't, they will leave their guard down and they can lose the battle because of that. And so he says, I don't run the race with uncertainty. Thus I fight. Not as one who beats the air. You know, in the New International Version, verse number 25 says that, that, let's go ahead and put it up on the open. It says, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. So why is it that in our, in our walk with God we think that we can handle the fights, the, the battles that life has for us and, and, and not do anything about it? To not sit under the Word of God, to not really get it into our hearts, to not really study it. And then when the hardships of life come, we wonder, why are we not effective? Why is God not responding to my request? Why is it that I say that I should resist the devil and he would flee, but then I try and it doesn't seem to work? Because we have not sowed in, in our lives, the Word of God. We have not put in the training. We have not put in the effort. We have not put in the time. You guys with me here? That God has told us, you have got to get this into your system so that when the time comes, we know how to act, we know how to respond, we know how to pray, we know how to live, we know how to speak. Are you with me? It takes training to press on. I'll tell you what, the Word of God is so powerful. In 1 Timothy, in the fourth chapter, Paul the Apostle is exhorting the young minister, Timothy, and he says in verse number 13, I'll just put it up on the overhead, he says, till I come. He's exhorting him for his return. Give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, to the word of God. Don't neglect the gift that's in you, which has been given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them. That sounds to me like a training regimen. You know, when somebody's swimming, let's take a, a, a Ryan Lochte, who just won the... Oh, sorry, told you it wasn't going to blow it for you. All right, let's say... Uh, We'll take Kobe Bryant, all right, who plays basketball, LeBron James, somebody like that. That way I don't blow it for you. When they're training, while they may play golf, they're not spending each and every day at the golf course saying, this is applies to my, my career. They're not at the baseball field swinging at, at, at baseballs. They're not, they're not, you know, they're not at the, at the tennis court playing tennis. They're focusing on their sport. They're focusing on free throws. They're focusing on three-pointers. They're focusing on layups, on blocks, on defense, on defensive moves. They are focusing on their sport, on their attention. But then you and I, we focus on everything else in our walks with God. We focus on, on what, what the news says. We focus on what's the latest drama on, on USA Today. Or we focus on what's, on what's the latest sitcom on. We focus on what's going on at work or what's going on with our family. And we don't give our attention to the word of God to put it into our heart. The word of God says, your word, David says, the psalmist says, I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. We have got to put, to sow the word of God in our heart so that way we become uh, ready for it. You know, there's a fun movie that Disney put out a long time ago about a certain bobsled team from a country that did not have ice. You remember that movie? It was called Cool Runnings. The Jamaican bobsled team. And they train, and you remember, they trained when they were in Jamaica on push carts. But then they got, if you remember the story, fun movie, when they got to the Winter Olympics, 
they were there and they, they looked at their beat up sled that they had. And what did they do? They studied the pictures. If you remember the driver, he studied the pictures of the turns. And he knew that turn one was this way, turn two was this way, turn three. And if you remember, there was a scene where they were practicing and there was this music montage kind of pumping you up, ready, getting ready, and they're going to do something good. And there's this scene where they're all in the bathtub together and they're reciting the track, turn one, and they all lean together. Turn two, and they all lean together. And they're all in unison, practicing, memorizing the course, visualizing the course. Why? Because it takes training. You and I, if we want to be effective in the race, if you and I want to be effective in the fight, if you and I want to be effective in, the, in, in what God has got st uh, in store for us, let me tell you something. There will be opposition, and you and I have got to train to prepare ourselves both mentally and spiritually for the fight ahead because it's on its way. And when we train, we become prepared for it. I can talk for hours about training. But we got to move on. So we're talking about pressing on. Pressing on when it comes to our walk with God. Number three, pressing on takes pain. What? What? Pastor Luke, you're talking about our relationship with God. Pressing on takes pain. I, I gave my heart and my life to Jesus Christ so that I wouldn't have any more pain. So then why are you saying today that pressing on is going to take pain? Let me tell you something. Paul equates our walk with God into an athletic race. Man, I can't tell you how many photos you've seen, how many videos you've seen of the athlete's face, the agony that they go through in their training process, the pain that they endure to push themselves forward to what they've got. They have got to push through thresholds of pain. Their body says no, 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 but they push through it. And it takes pain. Training involves pain. In pressing on, it involves pain. We think it's a pain-free. We think it's an easy walk. But all throughout the Word of God, we read that we will face issues. Jesus Christ said that if they, the world hated him, they'll hate us because of it. The Word of God says that we should take up our cross, follow after him. The Word of God says that we should count it all joy when we fall into various trials. So don't tell me that you thought that you were going to get into this walk with God and that Jesus Christ was going to take all your pain. Let me tell you something. He'll take your pain, and he is the one who is capable of carrying you through it, but it doesn't mean that you're going to live a life free of it. But God is able. He's stronger. His grace is sufficient, like Paul the Apostle said. It's going to involve pain. He says, therefore... In, second, in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, Paul the Apostle says, Therefore I run, thus I run this way, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Going back to verse number 26, he says, Thus I fight. So first we see that Paul equates it to a run, a race. Now Paul the Apostle equates it to a boxing match. Two people going at it. Let me tell you something. If you don't know your opponent, if you haven't trained for it, the, the fight will be short. You've seen it. Remember, there was a boxer, whether you, however you feel about him or not, doesn't matter. There was a man by the name of Mike Tyson that people would pay hundreds of dollars for a fight to see a fight. And within 35 seconds of the first round, the fight was over because they weren't prepared to fight somebody like that time and time again. It takes pain. And he says, I fight, not as though one who beats the air. And he uses the example of a shadow boxer, somebody that, that trains and they look at their own shadow, somebody that, that, you know, they loosen up their joints. You see the swimmers. You know, my wife hates it when they do this. And they, they flap their arms. And they, you know, they, they, they do this and they, 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 they shake their legs out. That's not resistance. That's loosening. And Paul the Apostle says, I fight, not as though one who, who loosens themselves. You see the boxer before the match. And they sit there, and you see them, you know, they go. You've seen them do that, you know, and they, they beat the air. That's not fighting. That's preparing their muscles for it. It's a preparation. And so Paul the Apostle says, listen, the fight is not about somebody who beats the air. It, 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 I push myself. You know, when you beat the air, you're not feeling anything, right? You're not in a fight. But then all of a sudden, when, when somebody uh, hits you back, you see it in slow motion, you know what I'm talking about? All of a sudden, you realize that you're in a fight. And now all of a sudden, you realize that all the training, 
all the drive has paid off because now you know, okay, I just got hit. You're going over it, you're saying, okay, it hurts. My body's saying no. My spirit, my flesh, my faith is wounded. How about that? Spiritual hit. And you say, you know what, though? My training says, the word of God says that Christ is able. The word of God says that I'm, I'm that well, through Christ I can get through this. Through Christ all things are possible. My training, my drive, my motivation says, and so we endure pain, but we get through it. Because it's resistance. That's what Paul the Apostle is saying, is when you fight the air like a shadow boxer, you're fighting no resistance. But you know how to get stronger? I remember when I was, oh geez, it was so long ago, there was a time when I tried out for the football team and I, and I washed out because I couldn't make it through the weight training. But I remember the football coach telling me, telling the whole team, the process of building muscle. You lift weights, you resist, your muscles resist the weight, it's heavy. And what happens is the fibers in your muscles tear. They rip, they pull apart, and then what happens is you know that feeling if you've ever ran when you weren't prepared to run, or if you've ever jogged or gotten on a bike or done anything when you've been sitting on the couch for a month, you know the next day. Oh, you know the second day. It's always worse on the second day. What happens is your body is mending itself, and the muscles, be, the fibers begin to pull apart. And what happens is the muscles go on the mend and they begin to rebuild themselves and they come back a little bit stronger. And then you lift some more and you lift some more and you in your muscles, you get sore again. You get, you get ah, my, my, my tendons, my joints, my hurt. You know, and then all of a sudden you look back through the time and you realize that you started out with a small amount of weight, but now all of a sudden you're lifting a great deal of weight. Well, let me tell you that spiritually. You start out with small battles. You start out with small fights. And then you look back in your life, you look back 20, 30 years in your life for walking with God, and you realize, wow, I'm bench pressing a heck of a lot more spiritually than I was 10 years ago. Why? Because of resistance. It may hurt for the time being, but when you come through it, you are stronger in the end. That's called resistance training. And that's what Paul the Apostle is talking about. I don't beat the air because there's no resistance. It takes pain. In 1 Peter, the first chapter, I'm just going to put two verses up on the overhead for you, just for time's sake. In 1 Peter, the first chapter, in verse number 6, it says this, In this that you greatly rejoice, thou, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. So we think that we come into this thing and that we're going to be pain free. But here all of a sudden Peter says, count it as joy, if now for a little while, if need be. Be. That means that there is a necessity for you and I to endure pain so that in the long run we can grow stronger. Because if we live a life without pain, if we live a life without hardship, we become lazy to the things around us. And so he says, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Now I want to jump back now to Romans in the fifth chapter. Third verse and, and fourth verse, it says, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Now we're talking about the spiritual. And perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And let me tell you something. In a race, in a fight, if there's no hope, there's no reason to push on. If there's no hope in thinking, I can push through this, I can get through this, I can win this, I can take this guy, I can beat this battle, I can beat this sickness, I can beat this situation. If we don't have hope, the battle's already over, the race is already over. What's the point of running? What's the point of competing? But because of, of, of trials, because of tribulation, we see that it produces perseverance. And perseverance gives us character, and our char character brings us to hope. The hope of the Holy Spirit that is set before us. Hope is essential in our lives. We have got to have hope. And through the pain that we endure, if need be, through necessity, we'll get through it through Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Last for tonight, we're talking about pressing on. Last one, can we do one more? Pressing on, number four, takes endurance. Pressing on takes endurance. What good does it do to start off good and not finish? What good is it to start off hard, to start off as a leader? You've seen, let's take a look of a, of a horse race. 
You've seen the horses. They get out in the front and you think, oh, oh, man, they're going to win, they're going to win, they're going to win, they're going to win, they're going to win. And then all of a sudden, the, the little horse, you know, the sea biscuit from behind comes up and starts to, to, to creep their way up and creep their way up and creep their way up. Because let me tell you something. It doesn't matter necessarily how you started the race. What matters is how you finish the race. But all too often in our lives, we go through it and we don't even get ourselves to the position where we are able to finish because we give up. We lose hope. We lose faith. We give up on the word of God and say, ah, oh, it's not for me. I'm dealing with this sickness. Ah, oh, you know what, God, God's got something else for me. And we lose the fight. But let me tell you something, to press on, to, to, to get to the prize that God has got for you and I is going to take a level of endurance. When an athlete, I was just listening yesterday to, to the guy, the USA rider for the cycling team, he got fourth place. He was saying that that's the worst position in the Olympics to get. And he was saying that on the ninth lap out of, out of 11 laps or 12 laps, he said on the ninth lap, his body was cramping all over the place. And his teammates were saying, you can do it, push on, you can do it, next to him. And he was saying, man, my body was just cramping up, cramping up, cramping up my legs, my, my chest, I, I couldn't breathe. But then he said he pushed through it. He was saying this in the interview. And he started to feel better. He started to get better, and he pushed through, and he came from the back to the beginning, or to the front of the line. And though he didn't medal, though he didn't get on a podium, he finished strong above 50-some other competitors. But he had to push through the cramping. He had to push through the hardship to get to that point, to finish the race. And so often, guys, we go through cramping. Let me tell you something. There's going to be cramps. Ah! There's going to be those hard times in our walk with God. They're going to come. And it's whether or not we have the endurance, the stamina to go for God all the way, to push through, and at the end of the race say, man, it was tough. Man, that was difficult, but I did it. I made it. I finished the race. Paul the Apostle at the end of his life says, I fought the fight. I finished the race. I got the prize. It takes endurance. What good does it do if you start and don't finish? What good do you accomplish in your relationship with God, church, if you start here today? You start five years ago and you wash out. What do you accomplish in your walk with God? Jesus Christ said, he who endures at the end should be saved. Whoa! 1 Corinthians in the ninth chapter. Verse 26, it says, I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. I have put myself into subjection. I have brought myself into, into the, to, to the rules, to the regulations. I have brought myself under accountability, Paul says. That way when people look at me, I am not disqualified in their eyes. You and I have got to run a race with endurance. You know, there was one time when I climbed a, on one of the local mountains in San Gregorio. You know, there's, there's points when you hike a mountain or when you climb a mountain where you lose sight of the summit and you lose motivation. You begin to look at the trail behind you, say, well, I've come pretty far, I don't know if I can go anymore. And then you come around the corner and you see the summit. You can see the top and you say, there's no more. It's taller than that. You get to the summit and there's a great joy and there's a great reward. You sign the, you sign the little register at the top, put your name in there for everybody else to see that you've made it, and you walk back down. But let me tell you something, I learned a lesson there. That we always talk about getting to the summit. We always talk about getting to the top of the mountain. That's only halfway. you got to get back down, too. Yeah. There are people that have been up to Everest that did not make it back down. What good does it do in your life if you summit Mount Everest, but you don't make it back to base camp? Because this is an endurance race, guys. And the journey down oftentimes is harder than the journey up because your body is worn out and there's nothing left. And now you've got to fight through the pain to get through. It took me twice as long to get down because let me tell you something. I'm young and my knees stopped bending. It took me twice as long to get down as it didn't take me to get up. My wife almost called the cops because she thought I got lost in the wilderness. What good does it do to make it up to the summit? Oh, great, wonderful, we're on the top of the mountain. I've climbed my mountain. You haven't climbed your mountain until you made it to the other side. Uh, Woo, come on, are you guys getting this? And it's going to take endurance, the understanding that God will carry us through. Jesus Christ is sufficient for us. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. His grace is, is enough for you and I, so we have got to understand that it's not on our own ability that gets us through, because when we rely on our own ability, what you know what we do? We start off strong. We run as hard as we can in the beginning of the race, and like that racehorse, towards the end of the race, when it counts, we lose our steam. 
But when we rely on the power of God, when we rely on the grace of Jesus Christ in our lives, now all of a sudden we have that pick me up at the end. That you know what that word, that term is? It's called a second win. We got a second win, and now all of a sudden, whoo, I got a little bit of step in me. I got a little bit of jog. Oh, I could go. I could fight this. I could beat this. I can make it to the other side of that mountain. I can make it down the hill. It's going to take endurance. In, in Hebrews, the 12th chapter, I'll put it up on the overhead. We're running out of time. Hebrews in the 12th chapter, verse number 1. Therefore, since we also, since, since, Therefore, also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. You know, I once heard it said that in the day that this was written, the seats in the great coliseums, the seats in the great athletic coliseums, you know, you've, you've seen them in, in Rome and in Athens and those things, the, the seats high up that the peasants would sit in that were affordable, the cheap seats, they called them the clouds. You and I, we call them the nosebleeds. You're sitting up in the nosebleeds, you need binoculars to see what's going on. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race set that is set before us. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to shed this cloud of witnesses. You think of, when I say this, you think of Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel. Let me tell you, you think of this. You think of little baby naked cherubim angels with their little angel wings, sitting on the cloud like this, <laughs> looking down on you, and that's your cloud of witnesses. But it says, therefore. Remember, therefore means that therefore of what I just said. You know what verse chapter 11 is? is we call it the hall of faith. It's the great ones that have gone before us. It says those who have looked ahead, who didn't see their reward, who didn't see their promises come, saw it from God through faith. What does that mean? It means, therefore, imagine this now. Visualize this as you, a great athlete walking into an arena as they call your name ready for your race set before you. And the stadium is full. The crowd is cheering and chanting your name. You can do it. So full that the cloud seats are packed. The nosebleeds are full. And you've got a stadium of all those who have gone before you who have finished their race, who have completed, who have seen the promises of God come before them, rooting you on. He says, therefore, thinking of that, a stadium full of those who have gone before you, cheering you on, run your race. Because you can do it. Verse number two says, looking unto Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, who ran his race. So don't think of when you think of the cloud of witnesses. Get rid of the cherubim, the little baby, fat, naked babies with angels. Get rid of that thought and think that you're standing in a full of stadium, a packed out, a sold out crowd. And let me tell you something, there ain't no 65,000 seat auditorium. We're talking thousands of years of people who have gone before you. We're not talking no 100,000 seat auditorium. We're not talking no 250,000 seat auditorium. We're talking millions and billions of people who have gone before you, rooting you on, saying you can do it. And run your race with endurance. How does that apply to our life? Because when we put these things into principle, when we put these things into thought, when we realize that it's going to take drive, it's going to take motivation to get beyond the feelings to get beyond the emotions, to get beyond what the flesh says that we push forward. It's going to take training. It's going to take realization about our enemy. We've got to know our enemy. Why? But let me tell you something, because our enemy knows us. Let me tell you something. If there's anybody that's ever studied mankind, you know it's the devil. And you know it's his devices to get into your, under your skin by knowing your weakness. Now it's time for you to know his weakness, Jesus Christ, and to understand how to apply the principles in your life. Number three, it's going to take pain. Don't be naive in your walk with God and realize that if need be, when necessity arises for you to face hardship, count it a joy know, knowing this, that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. That there is a hope ahead of you. And finally, it's going to take endurance. It doesn't matter what we do today. Paul the Apostle said, I press forward, leaving the things of yesterday behind. Why? Because if you wash out today, you wash out tomorrow, you wash out five years from now, what good is the race? you got a DQ next to your name. Don't want to have that. You want to have a number and a name. How many people you led to the Lord and your name? How about that for a number and a name? A legacy behind you. It's going to take endurance. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? Praise God.
Let me do one more thing. I want to ask everybody, please remain seated. Let me, ask, let me tell you why. Because when you get up, when you walk around, the Holy Spirit's going to minister to those of us in this building, in this room. And when you get up, when you walk around, leave early, whatever it might be, people watch you. They look at you. They, get, they look at you walk out. And they say, oh, look at the shirt they got on or the shoes that they're wearing. And they don't pay attention to what God has for them. So give me a moment more of your time, just a few more minutes. Let me ask you a question. If you were to leave this place today and you were to die, heaven forbid that be the case, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a simple question, but why don't we go over some of those answers that maybe you've had in your heart. You know, the Bible says that a man ought to examine himself from time to time. So let's go over that. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I'm not sure that God is real. I'm not sure that heaven or hell exists. So, you know, I don't know where I'd go if I'd die. Let me tell you something. Just because you don't, you're not sure if God is true or if heaven or hell are real or not, doesn't make a difference. Heaven or hell are, are real. God is real. And whether you believe it in your head or not doesn't make a difference, doesn't change the fact that it's the truth. That's like saying I don't believe in a semi-truck because maybe you'd grown up in a place where you had never seen one and stand on the freeway. Lo and behold, let me tell you something. You're going to meet one face to face. So here I am today, standing before you. I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough to tell you to quit playing games. You know, 20% of America in a new poll just came out and said that they're not sure that God exists. Let me tell you something, just because science, because some philosopher, because some young person or whatever may have said that doesn't mean it's not real. And Satan is after you to get you to sway your opinion on God. And it doesn't mean that God's not real. God thought it real enough to mention it in his word of God. Jesus Christ thought heaven, hell, real enough to speak about it in his teachings. Therefore, it's real enough for you and I to stop playing games with God and take it serious. Well, you know, but Pastor Luke, I, I think I get to heaven. I hope so. I really want to get to heaven. Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you think you're going to get to heaven, you're going to get there? That because you hope that you're going to get to heaven, that you're going to get there because you genuinely desire to find yourself in heaven, that you're going to find yourself in heaven. That God's going to look down and say, man, they wanted it bad enough, I'll give it to them. Can you show me where it says that in the Word of God? Nowhere will you find that. Well, you know, but Pastor Luca, you know, I, 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 my parents took me to church as a child. I was baptized, christened, attended Sunday school classes. I went to church on Christmas and on Easter. All my life, my parents told me that I was a Christian. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me the word of God where it says it because your parents had you baptized as a child? Because your parents had you christened because you attended Sunday school or Sabbath school classes that you're going to get into heaven? Can you show me in the word of God where it says it because your parents told you you were a Christian? Because you sit in a service, because you went to church on Christmas and on Easter, that you're going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says it? Nowhere. Nowhere will you find that. Can you show me the word of God where it says because you've given yourself the title of Christian, because you've called yourself that all your life, that you're going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says that in the word of God? Nowhere. That's like me sitting in the garage saying I'm a Honda Civic, I'm a Honda Civic. At no point in my life would I ever call my, would ever turn into a Honda Civic because I call myself that. Yet we believe that we're going to get into heaven because we simply call ourselves Christians. There's more to it than that, and I'll tell you about it in a minute. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I wasn't raised as a Buddhist, a Hindu, or a Muslim. So doesn't that mean by default that I'm going to get into heaven? I mean, I know that they don't, you know, or they may not go, but so that means, must mean that I go. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you were raised as a Buddhist, a Hindu, or a Muslim, or any other type of world or religion, that you're going to get your way into heaven. Nowhere will you find that. There's more to it than that. Here's one, here's one. Pastor Luke, Pastor Luke, I'm a good person. Good people go to heaven. I've never cheated on my taxes. I've never robbed the 7-Eleven. I've done more good in my life than I've done bad. So therefore, I'm going to get into heaven. As long as I stay good, that means I go to heaven. I've given to, to the Red Cross or to, to charitable organizations. For those of you who are young out here, Pastor Luke, I wear Tom's shoes. Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that good people go to heaven? That because you've never robbed the 7-Eleven? That because you've done more good in your life than you've done bad? That you're going to get to heaven because you've given to humanitarian efforts, to, to, philanthrop to philanthropist organizations? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that? Nowhere. As a matter of fact, the Word of God tells us that our good deeds, according to God, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. There's more to it than that. Well, but, but Pastor Luke, you know, I grew up in church. I was a volunteer. I, I, I sang in the choir, I was an usher, I helped out in the children's or the youth ministry. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? I've got a card in my wallet that says I'm a member to a church. You know, I've, I've memorized some scripture. I know John 3, 16 and a few other verses. You know, I know about God, I know about Moses, Jonah, Abraham. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? 
Where in the Word of God does it say that because you've memorized Scripture, because you've attended church, that you're going to get into heaven? You know, as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, that Satan quoted Scripture to Jesus. So therefore, Satan knows the Scripture, yet he's not in his way to heaven. The Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus is, yet they're not finding themselves in heaven. So there's more to it than just your knowledge of who God is, about memorizing some memory verses. As a matter of fact, let me tell you about this. Being a leader, an usher, a volunteer in a church, growing up in a church, a man in, in, in the book of John in the third chapter by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he says to Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? Simple question, what we're talking about today. The Bible tells us that Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a leader of the Jew. Jews. What that means is that Nicodemus had dedicated his young life to studying the Word of God. In today's society, Nicodemus would be like a Ph.D., and Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to get into heaven? And Jesus looks at Nicodemus and he says, you must be born again. Wait a minute. You've heard that term, born again. What is that? No, 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 no. That means weirdo, crazy, out of control Christianity. No, no, no. And you're going, there. no, no. Let me tell you something. The word of God from the beginning to the end, God's design has always meant this, that born again means this, that you have given him all of your heart and you have given him all of your life. God's not after your mental ascent towards him. God's not after your carnal knowledge of who he is. He's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. And that's why Jesus Christ looked to Nicodemus. You would think that because Nicodemus was welcome in the temple, you would think that Nicodemus wore the right clothes, said the right things, memorized the scripture, gave to the poor. You would think that Jesus would say to Nicodemus, pat on the back, man, you just keep on going. Great is your reward. But because God's design for you and I is to give him all of your heart, all of your life, he said you must be born again. It's not about how much you know the Word of God. It's not about how much you study the Word of God. It's not about how much you wear on the outside. It's about your heart inside that God's looking at. Jesus Christ, speaking to the church in the book of Revelation, says to them, I know your deeds. People like you and I sitting in service, sitting and hearing the Word of God, doing good things. He says, I know your deeds. When I come back, when it comes time for you to meet him face to face, he says that he better find you hot or he better find you cold. Because if he finds you lukewarm, he'll vomit you from his mouth. Oh! Shocking statement. Meant to get our attention. What does he mean? He means that when it comes back, when it comes time for you to stand before God, he better find you hot or cold. Because if he finds you lukewarm in your relationship with him, he will vomit you from his mouth. Cast you out as worthless is what the translation means. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me tell you what lukewarm means in, in relation to your, to, your, to your walk with God. Lukewarm means this. You're a little bit up, you're a little bit down, you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out, floating around in your relationship with God. Occasional church attendance, token prayer here and again, cross or St. Christopher around your neck, doing your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You got too much of God in you to enjoy the world. You got too much of the world in you to enjoy the benefits of knowing God. You're riding the fence, and Jesus Christ says if that's you living lukewarm, you are deceived in thinking you're going to make it into the kingdom of God. Well, then how do we make it? Glad you asked. Say, Pastor Luke, you find God your way, I'll find God my way. We'll all get to heaven the same. Let me tell you something. Let's not do it your way. Let's not do it my way. Let's do it God's way. Jesus Christ said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except through him. So let's not do it your way. Let's not do it my way. Let's not do it some well-meaning politicians or well-meaning author's way. Let's do it God's way. Jesus Christ said this, he says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. So here's what we're going to do in a moment. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, I'm going to count to three, I'm going to go three. I'm going to hit my hand on the Bible just like that. Make a real loud bang. In a moment, if that's you, if you've never given your heart, never given your life to Jesus Christ, I need you to pop your hand up. We'll do it all together at the same time. And what you're doing, when you raise your hand, you're saying, you know what, I want to... I want to acknowledge that I want to give my heart, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to surrender my heart and my life to him. Say, Pastor Luke, if I put my hand up, I'm going to be embarrassed. Somebody's going to see me. Listen, I'm not going to embarrass you because you put your hand up. But even if you were embarrassed because somebody saw you, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment going forward with God than an eternity in hell because you couldn't confess him in a warm and welcome place? What better place is there to confess Jesus and surrender your heart to your life to him today? So I'm not going to embarrass you. But even if you were, wouldn't it be better? You know, God's not a manipulator. God's not a conniver. He's not going to make his way or force his way in. You have got to choose him. God has already done everything he can for your salvation by giving his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody, hey, listen, let's be serious about this, a naked mess on a cross. 
hung on the cross for all the world to see, to bear your sin and your shame. Now he wants from you your heart and your life in return. He gave his everything, and now he wants your everything, your all. So let's quit playing games with God today. If that's you in the house, if you've never given all your heart, you've never given all your life to Jesus Christ in a moment, you need to get your hand up. If you're not sure, maybe, the, maybe you did that as a child, but you've been, you're not sure, maybe you've never made a public profession of your faith, today you need to get your hand up and confess Jesus Christ. If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, running from God instead of to, to God, you know, you haven't been wholehearted for God, but you haven't been wholehearted against Him either. Right in the middle, you need to get your hand up in just a moment. All across this auditorium, all at the same time, if that's you, be bold today and make a stand for God, what He's got for you. I'm going to count to three. If that's you in this place, on the count of three, get your hands up. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in the house today. One, I got you, brother. Two, three, four, five. All right, I got you. Six, okay, I got you. Seven, eight, I got you guys. You can put your hands on nine. I got you back there. Where are you at? You say, man, I wonder if I should do this. I wonder if I should do this. Get your hand up so I can see it and put it right back down. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. That's you in the house today. Where are you at? You say, man, I wonder if I should do this. You should do this today. The Bible says that our life is but a vapor. And I'm not trying to use a tragedy that happened a week ago, but let me tell you something. Those people that went to Colorado in the theater did not expect their lives to end. It's a gamble that you can't afford to make with your eternal life to walk out of these doors and expect to have another day. You don't know. If that's you, don't leave this place without making sure. Anybody else in the house today, get your hand up so I can see it. You can put it right back down. Nine wise people. Where are you at? Number 10. Where are you at? Saying, man, I wonder if I should do this. Nine wise people. Anybody else in the house today? Well, praise God for nine wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. Those of you who raised your hand, those of you who should have raised your hand, you said you wanted to give Jesus Christ all of your heart. You said you wanted to give him all your life. Let us help you. In a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand. I want you to be bold. Grab your coat, your purse, your sweater, a Bible, a friend if you need a friend, and come get out of your chair. Everybody will stand together. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair and come meet me here at the altar. You said you were going to give him all of your heart, all of your life. Come on, you come down. And that's you. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Let us pray with you today. You come. Come on. You can come. Come on. You come. If you didn't raise your hand, you get out of your seat. You get out of your chair. You come up here today. You can come. Come on. Come on. You can come. You come. Come on. Come on down, come on down. They're coming. Come on. You can come. Come on down, come on down. Meet me right up here at the altar. Come on, come on. You can come. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Hey, guys, listen. Today is the first day of the rest of your lives. And I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here in the hat waving at you? This is Pastor Dave. There he is waving. Pastor Dave is like the nicest guy that you'll ever meet, okay? What he's going to do is he's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. That only happens when Pastor Dan preaches, okay? So nothing weird goes on. He's going to take you right over there. I'm just kidding. And he's going to pray with you. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, to come into your life. So he's going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to give you some free things, a, a book that our senior pastor wrote. Very easy reading, very small book. It says, Welcome to Your Destiny. Hey, I just got saved. Now what do I do? Something easy to read to help you get strong, to get into the things of the Lord so that you don't go back to what you came from. And he's going to invite you into a program that we have here at the church called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Like when you go to the gym and you see a personal trainer, somebody helps you build the muscle, make sure you're eating the right food to get strong. A spiritual personal trainer is a friend. Somebody that will meet with you before a service for five weeks for 15 minutes and teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong in the things of God so you don't go back to the past that you came from. That's a five-week program, and I want to ask you one more thing. I want to ask that you commit to 12 months of teaching here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. I'm not telling you to, to, to come and to, to, to join a cult or anything like that. I'm, saying, I'm asking you to commit to 12 months, one year of sitting under the Word of God, and you watch. I promise you that God will change your life. I promise you that if you sit under the Word of God for one year, you will see a difference in your life. So I want to ask you to commit to that. So if you guys would just turn to your, to your right, to your left. Praise God. 